Okay, so um, welcome everybody to our webinar, which is on fertility preservation for trans people and those supporting them through the journey. Um, this is in conjunction with Pride Month for June 2023 and is looking at the decision making processes when considering gender affirming hormone therapy and fertility preservation. Uh, this is hosted by Dr. Orestes Sonis, who is a specialist in obstetrics and gynaecology, a speciality doctor in assisted conception, fertility preservation service at Guy's and St. Thomas Hospital NHS Foundation Trust. Um, we'll be offering non-surgical and surgical fertility preservation for oncolog oncologic patients at Guy's Hospital, as well as underrepresented groups of patients in the LGBTQ plus community, including transgender and non-binary individuals. He's currently working actively to establish an evidence-based service for the latter group of patients, and he will give you as much information as he can for this part of your journey. So I'm really, really pleased to welcome you, Dr. Orestes. Thank you so much for joining us. And I will hand over to you now for your presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this wonderful introduction. I think if my mom was uh, on air, she would have been very, very happy of uh, all these accomplishments. So it is a pleasure really to be here with you. I, I, I uh, A couple of months ago, I got in touch with the Fertility Network UK and I trying to communicate my ideas about transgender care. And they were really, really helpful. Claire, Bethan, Rina, uh, thank you so much. And I think that today's talk in, in the light and uh, during this month, that is a Pride Month, I think it's an exceptional subject that we all should uh, start thinking more about. So um, shall I start my presentation? Let me just... So as uh, um, uh, Claire already said, I am Orestes. I'm one of the doctors in the assisted conception unit. I'm working closely with uh, amazing clinicians uh, and a health, uh, health professionals that they are really exceptional what they're doing. And we do offer uh, fertility uh, treatments. We do offer all the, the spectrum of uh, treatments and diagnosis with regards to reproductive medicine and assisted conception. Mm -hmm. And I have been um, focusing my efforts on fertility preservation. This is led by my mentor, Miss uh, Julia Kopeka. She is a an, an wonderful person. You, you, you really need to meet her. She is uh, really, really an evidence-based uh, approach doctor. So our title today is Fertility Preservation for Transgender Patients. To be honest, this type of patients, uh, if you are, if among you there is any transgender uh, person, I know you are underreported and underrepresented, and I think that these talks would really help us have uh, a bit of perspective with regards to their care. So the top targets would be today to understand a bit of the basic principles behind human reproduction and also uh, um, understand and acknowledge the obstacles that usually transgender patients face throughout their transition or throughout their journey to find their own identity. To familiarize with some fertility preservation options and treatments to understand a bit how it works, is it going to pay, is it, is it going to be painful, is it going to be cost, uh, uh, very expensive. So uh, also to understand future reproductive, uh, reproductive options such as family building in a transgender patient, that would be adoption, that would be egg donation, sperm donation, all of these needs to be considered. Obviously, we will discuss about the effect that gender affirming hormones usually have on the reproductive system, re regardless of them being testosterone or estrogen. Uh, both of them, they act in a similar way. And also, it's all about raising awareness. So among you, most likely there are people that you might come across a transgender person, you might have a friend, you might be a parent of a wonderful transgender person. You need to know and understand how the human physiology works and where transgender care needs to be a bit more um, inclusive with regards to the specific needs that this uh, group of patients has. We will always promote evidence-based medicine and I try in this talk to offer you the latest um, evidence that I was able to find, find found on Alphabet. So I would like to declare that there is no conflict of interest. All of this, the evidence with regards to the transgender care is quite limited, but I've only tried to, to give you the essence of it, what it means with regards to the publications, what do they really tell us, what we understand through the evidence that it is available. 
A little bit about the history of transgenders. The very first known transgender was a king from Egypt. His name was Hatshepsut. Uh, it, it took me a while to learn the name. So apparently he, uh, he was declared himself as a king and he had a beard. It was a fake beard. Uh, he was born as a, as a, a female and he decided along the way he declared himself as a king. So this is the very first documentation of a transgender patient around um, uh, 1500s uh, BC. So in the 20th century, Hirschfeld and Benjamin, they try to understand uh, transgender people as people that they do have a disease. So they, they often call it as transgenderism and they employ some gender affirming primitive hormonal therapies, including testosterone and other weird drugs that they use at that time, that they have these anti-estrogenic or anti-androgenic uh, properties. So uh, obviously years went ahead, psychiatry, psychology, sociology expanded, and we realized that transgenderism is not a word we should use. Um, these people have specific diagnosis, and also they have specific uh, plans plans in their lives they have specific goals they are, have specific rights as all of us do so with regards to the very first uh interventions around the 30s the very first center surgery for gender affirming uh, treatment was introduced and in 60s obviously in usa it's usually progressive in those uh, type of uh treatments uh gender reassignment started a bit of uh, a, a little bit about the prevalence it's quite small based on a usa survey it's around 0.6 percent of the population that identifies a transgender person However, all of these studies comes from a Western European studies. That means that we need to take into consideration um, that it's really important to understand that not all transgender people want to, to transit uh, in uh, using hormones or to have a surgery. The, they do not really need to be defined for them. That's why it's really difficult to, to, to make protocols. They try to put people in some certain boxes biologically. However, being transgender is a spectrum of emotions and we are all unique, so do transgender people are. It is the same thing, exactly. So you need to understand the cultural and the, uh, the religion that they might be in certain countries. So that's why these people are often underrepresented and underreported. So although these studies come from Europe, Europe, you understand that the prevalence is quite small. So in our unit, we're seeing roughly 25 to 30 patients per year. And Obviously, this is expanding, and uh, as you see, you may see in this uh, slide, there was a recent talk. This is one of the very famous reviews for obstetrician gynecologists that underlined in 2018 that transgender care and non-binary care are expanding, and a gynecologist should have a lead role because many of these patients might require some gender affirming treatments, including some hormones that we do really know well. And also some of them might require surgeries. And we do know for the female reproductive part, the anatomy very, very well. We also need to acknowledge some potential barriers throughout their journey. So this is quite essential for all clinicians to understand. So why fertility experts should be added in this MDT supporting transgender care? So we focus mainly on reproduction, although endocrinologists, counselors, psychiatrists, uh, sociologists, mm -hmm. psychologists, medics, GPs, anyone really that is specialized in transgender care can get involved. We do get involved for the sake of reproduction. So reproductive medicine offer options in cases where gender affirming therapy is anticipated because there is an external trigger that might affect the fertility. And even if we haven't established yet the extent of this um, uh, infertility that these hormones may cause, we need to be mindful of it and offer reproductive options prior to any treatment. Let's discuss about the basic principles of human reproduction. So the chromosomal sex of the embryo is established at fertilization. 
in the past, there were civilizations like mine, I'm, I'm coming from Greece, that they they thought that uh, that the women, that they were not good women, they couldn't reproduce any males because males were the, the best individuals, the best types of humans, and they only gave birth to humans, only to find out later on through biology that it's the man that determines the sex. So the phyletic, the, the, the sex chromosomes uh, come uh, as a pair, one from a maternal source and one from a paternal source. The maternal source can only give an X because her sex chromosomes are XX. A paternal source that has an X and Y can give either an X or a Y. So at the end of the day, uh, although he does not make an active decision on it, the man decides uh, what is the sex of the fetus. So human reproduction starts with the embryo and on day 21 of conception, heartbeat cardiovascular system starts to develop. This is one of the most important systems in order to support life. And sexual differentiation starts at week six. That means for five, six, there is no sexual differentiation. So what happens after six weeks? Sexual differentiation is defined as the development of phenotypic structures consequent to actions of hormones. So it's hormone dependent. So this sexual differentiation is hormonally dependent and obviously genetically dependent. So what happens before six weeks? We do have a reproductive system that is bipotential. If you do see, uh, watch images through embryology, you'll see that we do look similar at the very early stages, regardless of being transgender, cisgender, males or females. So this is the very, the, on the top of the screen, you can see the primitive bipotential reproductive system and it regresses or enhances its some uh, specific regions and it gives you the male or the female reproductive system. So no wonder why the testicles look so much like ovaries, because with a different hormone, the testicles would have been ovaries, but the exposure was done in, in, in uterus. So it's just a theoretical idea to understand. So that's why it's really important to understand that the gonads, the organs that in the future will produce the gametes, the reproductive cells, the gonads can either be ovaries or testosterone, and this is defined by the chromosomes. And this is done through the hormones. So you can understand that men and women are not so different with regards to where they started from. Reproduction, reproductive function, as we discussed, is dictated by the biologically assigned sex. This is a given, this is just to declare, and whenever I see a transgender patient, I understand they have been through a lot. They need to understand that reproductive options need to be based on the biologically assigned sex. The majority of them are very well educated. They do realize that, but it's really crucial for everyone else surrounding, the parents, the friends, to understand how it works. So for a transgender man, you are expecting a female reproductive system. So there are some basic principles which I will talk to you about. And the same applies for transgender women who they have a male reproductive system. Just to, to, just to clarify a bit the, the, the words we're using, gonads, as I told you, it's the organs that they do produce the, the gametes. Gonads traditionally in cisgender men are called testicles. Gonads, gonads traditionally in cisgender women are called ovaries. They produce gametes that can either be egg for women or sperm for men. And uh, sperm is um, where the, the, um, the reproductive of the male part starts. An embryo is when an egg is fertilized by a sperm. So this is the basic uh, terminology that you need to be aware of. So what is a sperm freeze? Sperm freeze is when we ask of an individual to produce sample on demand in special facilities in our unit. In some cases, you can do that from home. And um, following that, we are able to store the sperm. We analyze it first, and then we can store it for future use. What is the benefit of freezing your sperm? 
by freezing your sperm, your sperm goes through the cycle of all these weird uh, tubules into your testicles and your penis. That means that throughout this journey, it does, uh, it just has one more function, which is the function of motility. So a sperm freeze, if especially if we do have large amount of it, we can use it in the future in intrauterine insemination. That means thawing the sperm that we have and then place it directly into the womb. No assisted conception is needed. So the sperm is one of the biological fluids in nature and especially coming from humans that is the best well preserved under low temperature. So you understand that sperm freeze has an advantage. However, especially for transgender women, that can be quite distressing. Some of, some of the transgender patients I have, they do ask me whether they can go ahead with surgical sperm retrieval. Yes, this is an option. Obviously, it could be a private option uh, in a sense that we do not make the rules based on the local commissioning groups. Uh, no one, even cisgender men, are not allowed without medical indication to go ahead with surgical sperm retrieval. So in order to go ahead with surgical sperm retrieval and be eligible for NHS funded treatment, you need to have azoospermia. That means no sperm in your ejaculate. So um, um, SSR can be offered. Some people discuss about electro ejaculation. Uh, this is usually used by Jewish people that they, uh, in their culture, it's not um, able to produce sperm. So they electro ejaculate whenever there's a disease. Uh, I feel that uh, if you are happy with sperm frames, this is an optimal idea. At the end of the day, uh, you will be experiencing this. You can uh, get an informed decision based on your preferences. And an egg collection is we give drugs to women to stimulate the ovaries, we give the same drugs to transgender men, we stimulate the ovaries, the ovaries are becoming enlarged, having follicles, which is the houses of the gametes, the houses of the eggs of the cisgender uh, female, and as soon as they are big enough, we just place a small needle and we collect the fluid from uh, the follicles. The embryologist goes through the fluid, finds the eggs, and finds out how many of them are matured enough. Uh, usually the overall process lasts five to 10 minutes, nothing more than that. It doesn't have serious anesthetic risks. Mm -hmm. And um, we will discuss why in transgender men, we often advise to go ahead with transvaginal approach. So with regards to the female reproduction, uh, the things you need to know that your gonads, your reproductive organs have a specific number of eggs. So you were born around with one to two million. The very first day you had your very first period, you lost 85% of them. So you've ended up having three to 400,000 out of millions that you had. And throughout your life, you will keep on losing. Why that happens? As soon as you get your periods, five or 10 of these follicles, they'll start recruiting, but only one will be the big one that will eventually release the egg. The other ones are doomed to regress. Again, not, not because there is something wrong with the system. It's just a clever selection process of nature to find the best quality follicle and expel the egg that reached the potential um, that the ovary expected. So as soon as these are expelled, you, uh, a female cisgender woman is expected to have three to 400 periods per month. That means she will release three to 400 eggs. So out of one to two million, you only need really three to 400 eggs. That's all it takes in order to have a child. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, the numbers and the quality decreases, especially after the age of 35. That's why it's most common for women after the age of 35 to experience a miscarriage. Just to note, after the age of 40, the miscarriage rate for anyone having female reproductive system is 40%, which is quite rough. If you, if you realize that we're just postponing our fertility, my sister had a child at the age of 31, and I still, still felt that she was a young girl. Uh, nevertheless, the egg requires the sperm, and the embryo needs to be in a womb. So it's important. So a woman is important, except of her ovaries, also for the womb. It does play a, a very important role. And whenever we do have uterine 
um, uh, these regularities or uterine pathology, the success rates of assisted conception are lower than in any other indication for fertility treatment. So having that in mind, you understand the importance of surrogacy and you understand that the person that is a transgender man that removed uh, his uh, uh, gonads and his, uh, and his uh, uterus, the, by any, there is no chance that he will decide in the future to carry a pregnancy, even if the uterus is intact, because this will require him to stop the gender affirming treatment. He will be on testosterone, and if he does carry a pregnancy of a female fetus, under the exposure of testosterone, this female fetus will become a masculine fetus. So all of these um, implications that these choices of our lives uh, have in our reproduction, I think it's really essential to discuss. Ability to carry a pregnancy is important, but also the ovaries, the gonads of the female reproductive uh, system play an important role in hormone function. The optimum fecundity for women is after the age of 24. So whenever we do, uh, it's this, the same applies for transgender men. Transgender men carries a female reproductive system. So around the age of 22, 23, it's reasonable to go ahead with fertility preservation. By having fertility preservation around the age of 15, 16, 17, first of all, it's quite invasive procedure that requires some maturity from the person. And also, in order to go ahead and start with, with even with the, with the treatment for the gender dysphoria, it, it will be after the age of 20, for, because you are a developing person during that time. So it's really important to understand all of these implications. With regards to the male reproductive system, men were, as always, a bit more lucky. The sperms are a continuously dividing population, and there is really no strong relationship between the quality and the age. Some studies have suggested that after the age of 60 or 70, the quality of the, of this, of the male sperm um, um, drops. But just to give you a glimpse, a glimpse of what the sperm numbers are, in an ejaculate of roughly two to three mLs, you're expect, expected to find 50 million sperm per mL or above. You can imagine that the poor woman releases one egg, whereas man produces millions of them. So the male factor subfertility is something that we can easily uh, um, um, change. And usually, even with lifestyle modification, the majority of cisgender males that they have issues with the sperm is due to the increased temperatures. Long baths, they cycle a lot, they're using the laptops on the laps. It's the same with, uh, with transgender women. They do place the testicles and the penis on the back in order to create a more feminine and more appropriate contour. So sometimes this increases the temperature uh, in the gonads and the sperm quality, even without the initiation of the, of the testosterone is of, of the estrogen is affected. So you can imagine that before, in, before even thinking of having a treatment that potentially going to affect the quality of the sperm, Transgender women have already lower sperm parameters. However, as I told you, men and transgender women produces millions or hundreds of thousands of sperm. So it's easy at the end of the day just to pick one. The eggs are more difficult, the gametes coming from the female reproductive uh, uh, part. So the sperm in the ejaculate is really important because it's able to swim, as I told you. Yes, we can have surgical sperm retrieval, but again, because it's quite invasive, even the sperm we will retrieve will require assisted conception. So it, we won't be able to use it in any other way. And also, it is important for the hormone hormonal function. It produces a lot of testosterone and it helps the, the, the males as much as estrogens are helping the females. The fertility preservation options are dictated by the reproductive system. So for transgender men, we go ahead with gamut or embryo preservation. Um, to be honest, in the past, embryos were far better. Um, they showed better endurance during the uh, cryopreserving process. But nowadays, we adopted a new way of uh, freezing things. It's called vitrification which is basically we, we freeze things really, really fast with liquid nitrogen. 
And it seems that gametes and embryos can survive equally. Well, gametes can be like 3% less, but at the same time, they offer you auto autonomy. So in the future, if you come to me um, to seek fertility uh, uh, preservation and you go with your partner, it's always best to have some extra gametes in storage only for you, because in the future, there might be some legal aspects that they, were, they weren't that dissipated. Uh, ovarian tissue cryopreservation, especially during the general female surgery, if we remove the ovary, we could always cryopreserve it. And fertility preservation for transgender women, uh, usually we go ahead with the sperm freeze. As I told you, there are other options, but we advise whenever it's acceptable to go ahead with a sperm freeze through masturbation. Gametes and embryo preservation, the overall process lasts two to two and a half weeks. So it's once or twice a day of small injections that they really block the brain and speak to the ovary, creating a lot of follicles. These follicles increase in size and increase the estrogen. Obviously, we are well aware that gender dysphoria uh, is usually treated in the majority of cases by adding the opposite hormone. That means it's strongly hormonal dependent. So you, you might expect that transgender uh, um, uh, men that they go through this process might develop some unpleasant symptoms. The issue is that we do have anti-estrogenic agents that minimize the circulating estrogen by 75 to 80%. It doesn't really affect our part, but it does offer a better experience to the to the patients. We offer the scans from the tummy, but we need the bladder to be full, or which can can be quite uncomfortable. Or we can go ahead with a transvaginal scan. In my unit, we during the follicular tracking, which is one or, once or twice during these two two and a half weeks before the egg collection to see where we are in terms of the dimensions, we go ahead with an abdominal scan. Uh, it's easy, the follicles are big, we're able to see it. But I always ask my uh, transgender uh, male patients whether it's it's fine for me to go ahead uh, uh, from down below. And the reason is, it's better for us because the machine is, uh, gives us more information, the image resolution is better, the the, the complication rate, uh, rate is uh, better, there is no surrounding structures. The ovaries are so large, it's so easy to pick up the fluid. Uh, even in uh, patients that never had penetrative sexual intercourse and there is a hymen, we do use pediatric probes, so uh, except of tiny spotting that does not come through the hymen, comes from the vaginal wall that was penetrated, you're not expected to have any difference in your life. And the majority of, of patients, because they're going to be under sedate, uh, sedation, they do not remember or feel anything. As I told you, as a process is five to 10 minutes and always respecting patients' uh, uh, desires. Um, so we collect the reproductive cells under sedation, there are some mental implications that we discussed during the process. Uh, transgender um, men are really vulnerable throughout this process. And it's not about the estrogen part. They do um, uh, go in units that they are female do uh, dominated. Um, uh, sometimes uh, the sonographer or people that are less experienced or, or uh, less aware, uh, they might use very binary terminology. Uh, nevertheless, that we, we do have specific services so we can accommodate the needs of these patients. And also, we need to discuss about future reproductive cons considerations, because even if you cryopreserve your, um, your eggs, if you remove your womb, you will need to find first the sperm donor and then the surrogacy, which is quite difficult in the UK and is not offered under NHS. Why do we go from down below? As we discussed, it is an established techniques. And at the uh, first and foremost is the safety in the medical point of view. There is a fast rec recovery. We do use tiny, uh, tiny small uh, probes and there is a minimal input to the surrounding factor uh, um, tissues. Ovarian tissue grab reservation was established in my uh, wonderful unit here at Guy's Coast. I'm really proud of it. It's it's an amazing uh, work. Um, it usually um, is uh, um, given to patients that they have severe 
cancers such as leukemia or lymphomas, or that they do require a, in a very, uh, very urgent chemotherapy. And because ovarian tissue cardiac preservation can be done within 24 hours through a keyhole surgery, which is the safest of the surgeries that they exist, you just remove one ovary and then the patient can have his chemotherapy or her chemotherapy and come back. And if the other ovary is menopausal, that means it's depleted of the eggs because the chemotherapy attacks the actively dividing cells, not only the bad ones, but also the good ones. Mm -hmm. Then you can use the other one or placing some small stripes of it back. And then you can either have natural con conception. Can you imagine? You just put it back and then you can have uh, natural conception. Or you can put it in your hands, take hormones and take the eggs out of the hands. And also you can restore your hormones. So this is for two reasons, not only to preserve reproduction, but also to preserve your hormones. So it's really important to select carefully the patients and um, uh, to understand that there is no funding at the moment under NHS. And all of these patients are, funding, are funded through charity or through uh, self-funded treatment. So we do not recommend for uh, transgender men to go ahead with ovarian tissue cardiac preservation because it does require gender affirming surgery to remove the gonads. And we cannot really use this tissue into our labs and create embryos. We need to put it back in order to create the embryos. But by putting it back, the hormonal restoration occurs and maybe it will exacerbate the symptoms of gender dysphoria. I don't know, there are no studies on that. It is invasive and it's for sure not cost effective. Sperm freeze, ideally as we discussed through masturbation and that can be really distressing. Uh, there might be transgender uh, women that they decide that they do not want to masturbate at all. Even um, long abstinence can have a negative effect in the quality of the sperm. But it may require more than one visit. We'd like to store as much as possible, especially if there are some um, um, deranged sperm parameters, it's best to have more. Uh, as I, I discussed, there are other alternatives as the surgical sperm retrieval and the electroejaculation. And the testicular tissue uh, uh, preservation in comparison to the ovarian tissue, it's still experimental and it's only offered to children so far. Some special consideration about the transgender women. We anticipate low sperm counts even before. That's why we do advise to come back as soon as possible. We do tell them about the gen genital tacking, the, 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 the way they, they use uh, their body in order to express themselves that might have a, de a negative impact to the sperm. So as I told you, the ovaries and the sperm, they looked alike, but they differentiated after the, the week six of the um, fetal life. So the testicles decided to leave the body. They're outside of the body. There is a reason behind that. They need lower temperature for optimal spermatogenesis. That means whenever the testicle is not descended correctly, or whenever there is anything that affects the testicle as it is, or whatever increases the temperature and down below will result in poor sperm parameters. So as long as you understand that, uh, it, it, it's best, especially if you're considering to, to uh, freeze your sperm. So during a couple of months, three months, the sperm we produce today is 74 days old. So whatever happened two to two and a half uh, months ago will reflect in, on our sperm today. So it's best to have a gap to two to three three months. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there might be some drug misuse. Uh, there, as I told you, and I will say it again, underrepresented adding is reported. No wonder why these people present with severe anxiety or stress, and they might end up uh, um, alleviating their symptoms through a drug misuse. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not the norm, but it's something that you need to be aware of. Anyone that is uh, going through such rough journey is more vulnerable and more prone to them. So um, frequent ejaculations, as I told you, really helps with the quality of the sperm. This does not usually happen to transgender women. So this is something that we need to discuss before we freeze the sperm. With regard to the, to the transgender men, as I told you, the overall experience is distressing, even in cases that they remove the breast, just because there is some tissue there, a mammal tissue there, through the exposure of estrogen, this patient might experience a, 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 a breast enlargement, a chest enlargement, if I may say so. 
Yeah. Although this is reassuring in a sense that the organs worked through the hormones, it can be quite distressing to these patients. And we always advise that after a week or two, this it will subside. Usually, and the majority of cases within a month, the person feels completely normal. Even the overall process of retrieving the gametes, uh, as I told you, the majority of patients have only transabdominal scans, and during the procedure, they, they, they will go ahead with an approach from down below. So this can be also stressful. It does require two to two and a half weeks, whereas with men, they can, uh, if they book an appointment, they can offer a sperm a production on Monday, Wednesday, done. And there might be some side effects, bloating, bleeding, shortness, mood swings that might exacerbate the overall um, mental state. The fertility preservation is a wonderful weapon, and we do offer it, especially to oncologic patients or patients like transgender individuals that they might go ahead with some hormone that might reversibly or irreversibly affect their ability to reproduce. However, you need to understand that there, there are some limitations. Even if we do have exceptional sperm or a great number of, of eggs, Usually with the young patients, uh, uh, an, an account of 10 or 15 eggs is considered ideal. Even if you do have such great numbers, everything looks great, the age is amazing, and there was no effect by any other hormones, there is no specific number that can guarantee 100% of a pregnancy. This is a lottery um, for, a, um, uh, for a person having a female reproductive um, uh, system. Remember, if we do get 15 eggs at the age of 25, the chances of having one live birth is roughly 65 to 70 percent. At the end of the day, we just need one. We, I'm just giving you the statistics. Mm -hmm. So, and then you need to understand that although we collect the gametes, after that, it's another discussion. How will we using these gametes? NHS does not fund assisted conception in the future. And this, although this is the Cost effective part. The, the, the expensive part is to go through the first part of the treatment, especially for transgender men, of these two to two and a half weeks of hormones. Uh, however, you need to think about donation and surrogacy, whether these patients, either transgender men, would like to carry the pregnancy because they might require specific care throughout their obstetric journey. So, why don't we offer fertility preservation during or after the gender affirming hormone? To be honest, I was looking through the evidence. The evidence is quite low. There were 186 papers, out of which 110 were only addressing uh, legal aspects, um, philosophical questions about whether everyone can have the right to have uh, uh, children, and last but not least, parental desire, because we wanted to have at least 70 papers, uh, 70 papers to understand whether transgender people want um, a child or not. We didn't uh, thought that this is something, it's a human need. Nevertheless, uh, the evidence is quite limited. Uh, there is no, uh, we don't know about the long-term effects. So yes, you can be on testosterone, you can be on estrogen, but the quality of your gametes, we do not know whether they're gonna be affected, whether the embryos that they will later on be reproduced will have any genetic abnormalities. There have been reported cases uh, of one or two patients that they were going through sperm freeze or egg collection while being on their hormones. But again, there are other studies suggesting that being on these hormones, the, the quality dro drops and also even the sperm might have uh, irreversibly, irreversible changes. And at the end of the day, you might be infertile because of them. So because we do not know, and we do need to offer evidence-based medicine, it's best to have fertility preservation just before any intervention, whether it's gonna be medical or surgical. If you do have a medical treatment and you decide to step up and go ahead with surgery that might result to permanent sterility, again, Regardless of you being on the hormones, it's best to come back and check with us whether there's anything that needs to be offered. It's quite a shame whether there's options to avoid them and have in the future uh, some uh, um, other thoughts of why didn't I do this and uh, feel that you missed out on something. It's best to have an option in life. The reality is, and this is based on a survey of 2010, that one out of 
five transgender adults reported being denied of medical treatment, harassed, or disrespected. They have been created, there are bodies that they are created like Endocrine Society and WPATH, that they do try to establish a pathway for these uh, individuals. However, I think we're, we are becoming more inclusive. If I can talk for my hospital, a guy's hospital, the assisted conception unit, even in people of a different generation or a different background, different religion, by um, having these talks, having these discussions, I see that a lot of them understand the issue and they are there to help and support transgender individuals. Nevertheless, you need to understand that there are some important limitations still we meet these people. So we get the referrals and we see them within a week. Usually we can see them within the week. The issue is that the, the appointments, this is from the official side of the NHS Gender Identity Clinic, and it says, we are currently offering first appointment to people who referred in July 2018. You can imagine that this was just before COVID. Can you imagine how will the list, list will look in a year's time? So the problem is that in order to offer fertility preservation treatment, you need to have a gender identity clinic appointment under NHS or an NHS certified private clinic. And we did have patients that they have private letters letters from a clinic that was private and the local commissioning groups declined their fertility preservation. We asked again, because the majority of the doctors working in private sector do come from NHS, so it doesn't really make a sense. They, they just need to give more opportunities. Somebody paid for his care. He shouldn't be banned for from the overall system. Nevertheless, the majority of the clinical commissioning groups are happy to consider that, and they do change their protocol. The issue is that they never thought about it. They only thought that the only way to get a gender identity clinic letter would be through NHS. So this is something that is changing, and we as um, a fertility preservation uh, service, we try to speak with the local commissioning groups, uh, raise awareness, and help patients get their treatment earlier on. As uh, you understand, the overall process of transition requires a lot of doctors. We need to offer at that time before the gender affirming hormones might affect their fertility. And also we need to understand about NHS funding requirements. Just to underline the impact of the waiting list in this patient that they, the problem is that they do spend five, six years, not only to come to meet us, but to start their treatment as well. Testosterone or estrogen or any form of gender affirming hormone has been through, through publications, has been an established treatment for gender dysphoria. These people will feel much better if they get their cure. So we are denying them their cure because of a huge waiting list. So I went to a club with my boyfriend the other day and I found this beautiful book. And there is another transgender man, and uh, it talks about bridging prescriptions. I was amazed of all this important information that this person wanted to give to his colleagues with regard to gender affirming hormone. How to ask your GP to prescribe you unlicensed medications, where to find, what to tell them. And the majority of them, it said on the book, the majority of them, they will, uh, they will understand the situation. They will be aware of the situation. I'm not saying that... Uh, I, I was really moved by it, but this is not evidence-based. We need to offer to transgender patients the best quality care. So if these books exist, that means that people are in danger. So we need to raise awareness. And I understand that you can get fertility preservation beforehand. And the majority of the local commissioning groups, they will, if finance is not an issue, they will um, uh, uh, make you eligible to go ahead with fertility preservation, even with a private letter. Special consideration with the overall treatment and fertility preservation of this population, we need to understand and we need to discuss why we do what we do. Why do we need to have a scan from down below? Why is better to, to produce sperm? These people are highly intelligent. They have been through uh, a lot through their lives. They are very well educated. They know that the bat, the gray literature, they know the evidence base. They're really, because they, 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 they spent 
uh, quite a lot of their time finding answers that the system does not provide to them. So uh, by explaining the rationale, by explaining the evidence, the majority of them, based on my experience and only, they will be able to understand what is happening. Uh, nevertheless, you need to discuss contraception for transgender uh, men that they do have uh, penetrative sex, although while on testosterone, most likely you won't be getting any bleeds. Remember that you still can carry a pregnancy because of that. You can still pop a gamut and uh, create an embryo. Contraception needs to be discussed and also future reproduction of be discussed and uncharted territory, it's still the medical, legal and societal implications that all of us need to consider. So the more we make aware, the more we have experiences with transgender patients, the more we'll be able to support and establish systems that are inclusive of their needs. Based on our experience, my service uh, at uh, Guy's Hospital started in 1995 and under the lead of my uh, mentor, Ms. Julia Kopeika, uh, we expand, uh, expanded the service in transgender care, again, to know more. Having research on our existing patient, we, we do have a specialized team that is well-trained to meet the transgender patient's need. And obviously, we strive to improve the service and we strive for evidence-based uh, um, um, medicine. We established some uh, protocols and this work has been submitted uh, and we really set the scene for others how these patients need to be treated. It, it's of top priority to have an inclusive environment by using the correct terminology, by having people that they understand the differences. You need to discuss about the lifestyle modification from genital tacking up to uh, drug misuse, anything really that might affect their fertility. Mm -hmm. And especially for men to uh, explore the frequency of ejaculations and also to offer home ejaculation in order to minimize the negative, uh, the negative feelings that somebody might have in a unit producing on demand. Uh, the more the merrier, so the more sperm you freeze, the more likely is to have a good number of vials and better chances in the future. And because the, I do have some patients that they ask me about uterine transplantation, this has happened. There have been more than 40 cases and two of them already gave birth, I think. Uh, imagine that, where uh, cisgender females were um, had a uterine transplantation, but there are a lot of concerns for transgender women because the anatomy of of a um, of a f um, sex female uh, male assigned sex uh, body is quite different, and perhaps there's no room or the vascular pathways in order to create a safe environment for for uteruses. Mm -hmm. So yes, it can happen in the future, but best to have realistic goals of what do you want to to have with regards to your family building uh, building options in the future. And with regards to, to males, uh, you need to, again, offer an inclusive environment. We need to offer a safe approach to stimulation. We can offer letrozole and anti-estrogenic uh, factors. We know that through, through women that they had breast cancer with estrogen receptor positive. We gave them that. So because these breast cancer tumors are hormonally dependent, we minimize the effect. So we know that regardless of this hormone, the local work of the gonads is, that does not really require such high, high levels of estrogen. So this is a safe option for anyone offering um, treatment to uh, think about this. And also you need to uh, get prepared that because these gonads are gonna be enlarged, you might have bloating, you might have discomfort, you might have some hot flushes, some, as we call it, menopausal signs. It can happen to anyone, but uh, the overall process can be a serious stressor, especially for transgender men. Overall, the basic, and based on what we found, based on the available, available literature, it's best to stop any gender affirming, affirming hormone, whether it's testosterone or estrogen, at least three months before you go ahead with fertility preservation treatment. I need to underline here that in order to get NHS funded treatment, there shouldn't be any history of gender affirming hormone in the first place. So whoever uses gender affirming hormone, I don't, I, I, 
don't get me wrong, I do not set the rules. I'm not saying that this is the correct thing to do. I'm just giving you information with regards to who is eligible to get NHS funded treatment. Mm. So also you need to understand that uh, your reproductive system, uh, regardless of being male or female, you often neglect it. You do not really attend to the cervical screening or to your um, STD screening, any uh, breast screening. So it's really important that these people understand that there are screening programs that really prevent cancers from happening. So we really need to encourage them that they need to, to engage with such screening protocols. We have all, we do offer fertility preservation. I'm a proud member of the wonderful uh, fertility preservation service under uh, the lead of Ms. Ms. Julia Kopeika. In 2019, we started offering ovarian tissue cryopreservation. And one of the founders was the professor, was Professor Dusko. He was the one who initiated me on uh, finding and expanding my horizons with regard to fertility preservation, the transgender care. Um, we have wonderful colleagues, Joshua Last, uh, Regina, Tamara, Eleanor, uh, Max, uh, Andrea, anyone really, and or um, Ali and Ryan. Um, I really want to speak on behalf of all of them because we're really proud because we're striving to to offer to our patient the best available treatment. You can self-refer as we discussed. Just Google up smart survey and fertility preservation, and you can go ahead. And we can always consider a, a private clinic letter as long as it does have uh, as is done by an NHS um, uh, accredited center. We already developed some patient leaflets and um, they are non-binary and for transgender patients. And we're really proud of that. And I will finish my talk by uh, giving like a couple of things that I want to share to the parents of the audience. And if, if I was a transgender um, uh, female, yeah. I would uh, like my parents to know this as well. It's really important to understand that accepting and supporting and the commitment that you need to show to your child is the most important thing with regards to uh, the well-being of your child. You need to educate yourself. Uh, whoever is here, it's even if you do not understand uh, all of the terms and all of the things, you are here and you want to make a difference by understanding all of this terminology, terminology and medical stuff and any other uh, legal or psychological aspects, you understand better your child. Uh, Obviously, active listening, communication uh, with your child will encourage um, uh, your child to find a purpose, find his plan, and be able to respect their identity. It's really important to understand that we do have human rights, and especially in rep reproduction, is a human right of all of us. Um, seek professional support if needed and obviously understand that there are many professionals that they might be specialized on the on the field as we discussed we don't see a lot of patients unless we are a specialized center where we do have an accumulative um, uh, experience connect with support networks uh, as fertility network uk is be an advocate i remember uh growing up as a gay man the the biggest battles of my social life were, were done by my best friends whether they were females or males they were always there to to be an advocate of my needs and i didn't have to do much so i had a very nice uh childhood Mental health and well-being is our top priority, especially after COVID 2019. You understand that all of us are a bit anxious, are a bit depressed. Mm -hmm. Nothing really makes a sense. So it's really important to understand that there is the physical care, but there is also the mental care that we need, uh, that we often neglect. Self-expression is uh, it's a mandatory um, uh, thing that anyone uh, that wants to have a better approach with their children or their family should um, explore. Mm -hmm. And from my side, I would like to uh, tell you that we try to focus on societal fertility preservation. That means any fertility preservation that relates with society or social reasons. Mm -hmm. um, the issue is that all of our knowledge come from oncologic patients, that there was no time and we're able to offer uh, all the treatments uh, during that time. Now that we do have established 
treatments that they have minimal side effects. You, I did give you some um, idea of the complications, but do not expect that the majority of patients will have issues. The majority of them have a pleasant journey. Everything goes as planned because they are prepared even for the bad things that they will happen. I myself come from a cisgender family. I, will, I am happy to have these wonderful parents. However, uh, myself, I would never been able to imagine my family building without the wonderful miracles of assisted conception and reproductive medicine. So be aware that as long as this society expands, your options might be even more. So it's best to preserve your fertility. Now it's a human right. The majority of us in the future, by seeking reproduction, we might need to um, um, find a purpose in life. Uh, it, it could be narcissistic, could be a strong source of egoism, but this is something that we all seek. Uh, even through adoption, we want a natural um, um, uh, sequel of our lives. And uh, as Jean-Paul Sartre uh, said, as persons, our individuals, we are limited, we are defined. But as humans, as parts of this whole group, we are indefinite, we are endless. Thank you so much. Wow. Thank you so much, Dr. Orestes. That was incredible. What a wealth of information. I think my, my mind's Thank trying you. to, to take it all in. Um, so we haven't had any questions coming through on the Q&A, but if anybody does have any questions, please do feel free to pop them in there and I will ask them. But I did get a couple of questions that came through um, prior to the webinar this evening so you've answered quite a lot of them but there is a couple that I just want to run past you if you're okay with that of course um so one of the questions was um do we have to do fertility preservation in order to access gender support in the NHS in terms of hormones and surgery they don't want to do it but they're feeling forced into it by family and they're being sort of told that the gender service won't look favorably on them if they don't do it uh, to be honest, you don't re re require to do fertility preservation. However, by attending to the very first counselling, first of all, will help you to make an informed decision. And second of all, will expedite the next step. If you decline after you uh, you appear or you attend to the, the appointment, it's within a month or two, you can start your treatment with no issues. Whereas if you do not attend to the fertility preservation, this might get up to six months in order to be referred to the specialist that can prescribe gender affirming hormones. Okay, thank okay. you. Um, you talked a bit about, we had a question coming in about um, clinics refusing to do surgical sperm retrieval um, and people not being prepared to give their own sample. You talked about uh, electro ejaculation for a complete layman out there. Can you explain a bit more about what that is and is that available on the NHS for people? So, um, to be honest, I'm an immigrant. I've never tried to describe it in the past to anyone else. <laughs> so, apologies in advance for the poor choice of words. So, um, we do use that for horses. So, um, there is a small, like a vibrator that as you may already know, the prostate gland, if it's a very great hormone of sexual pleasure, if it gets uh, irritated or if something tickles the prostate gland, then ejaculation occurs. That's why um, uh, men that have sex with men, if they have uh, an acid role, they might have uh, an ejaculation, although they do have anal sex. It's because the, the penis meets the prostate gland and it presses the area and produces the sperm. So uh, in patients that they are Jewish, not all of them, they're, they're Orthodox Jewish, uh, they're not allowed to produce sperm through masturbation. So there are two ways. So the first way is to use a condom that has no spermatocyte. So they get a condom, they do a small hole, like a very small one. They have sex with their partner and they get the condom back to the fertility expert to go through the sperm and use it for assisted conception. Why do they make the hole? Because if God wants them to get pregnant, the sperm will go through this hole. This is their belief. So it's the same. So except of that option, if you have an adolescent and you want to produce sperm, there is no other way if he cannot masturbate. So instead of doing the surgical sperm retrieval, which is quite 
it's a young man, he doesn't really need a surgery, we need to consider the anesthetic risk and the cost, obviously, by putting him only to sleep and placing a small vibrator near his prostate gland, then you get the sperm that you need. So why anesthesia? Because if this would happen without anesthesia, it's quite painful. Okay, thank you. And Sorry, yeah. too much information. <laughs> that was great. All the information we needed. Um, in terms of availability on the NHS, would that be something that's offered or would that be something people would have to pay for? Uh, uh, so except of surgical sperm retrieval that is offered in patients that they have no sperm in their ejaculate, so there is a medical indication, mm -hmm. except of these patients, regardless of being transgender or cisgender, um, elect ejaculation is not offered in the NHS part, but many hospitals, just like guys in St. Thomas' uh, Trust, they do have a pri private sector that they might accommodate such needs. Okay, thank you. That's great. Um, you mentioned a little bit about um, people that are in the sort of process of changing their names and that side of things. And somebody asked a question about, um, would my gametes be stored in my dead name or my new name that I use now? Um, and also, will the clinic call me by my new name, even if I haven't legally changed it yet? So, uh, obviously, it's all about communication. I feel that there, there, there is no appropriate professional that it, whenever we have a patient and have a special request that we always need to abide with that so i would say that uh, yes we need to abide with the with the with the name that suits you best so it's up to you to tell us we do have pa patients that they come from different countries that the names are too long or uh, difficult to pronounce, but they use their own uh, names and we respect that. It's the same with transgender individuals. Mm -hmm. The issue is that uh, based on, on the experience I have with my patients, the majority of the transgender patients are able to change their names in the very early stages of transition. That means that it's quite easy to change your name. Uh, so the majority of my patients, usually they come to me um, after five or six years of waiting that this is, has been taken care of. If you have a little preservation and you wanna change the name of the gamut, you just need to contact your team and then you just need to sign the relevant forms with the correct name. Okay, so that can take place at any point really. Yes. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Um, so you you talked a little bit as well about um the recommendations in terms of fertility preservation and that you would recommend people would to do that before they started on um hormone replacement. And you suggested that actually not going ahead with fertility preservation under the age of twenty two would be advisable. Um, what does that mean for people who are sort of haven't maybe reached sorry, puberty sorry. yet? Uh Maybe I, I was um, I, I didn't put this right. So I, I told you about the ideal uh, reproduction for the female reproductive system after the age of 50, uh, 24 up to the age of 35. And for the males, usually after the age of 18, 19. So it means mm -hmm. that essentially fertility preservation can be offered usually after the adolescence. We need a body to be fully uh, functional, fully developed in order to have the best quality of the gametes. Even if you do get eggs of uh, a female cisgender patient of the age of 20, the quality is expected to be lower than the one that would be at the age of 24. So the, the later, the better, in a sense. However, just because we do acknowledge that gender dysphoria happens in the majority of cases, in some cases in adolescence and after adolescence, not all of these patients will go ahead with any form of transition, fertility preservation would be, first of all, impractical and quite invasive for a very vulnerable uh, um, group of adolescents that they haven't made their minds or they, they try to explore. You've been through adolescence. Uh, we've all been through adolescence. Mm -hmm. It's a, a, a period of exploration. And it does, except of the physical changes, it does require some mental and emotional intelligence in order to go ahead with options and decisions with regards to reproduction. Okay, okay. I, yeah, I misunderstood that. Um, so just to clarify, um, we had a question about um, 
someone's son who hasn't yet reached puberty but wants to start hormones now um obviously your recommendation has been that they should have the depreservation before they were to start on the hormones yeah. what would you recommend to a parent in that position can he undergo some kind of preservation before puberty or, or you know what are the success rates if he has so so too early? Before, before puberty if we initiate the treatments uh it's really important because that's why it, this is done by specialized endocrinologists the way we use the drugs mm. if we initiate the hormones before the 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 at the early stages of uh, adolescence, just before puberty, uh, it's really likely that we'll have issues with the structure of the bones and with the structure of the overall development. Obviously, um, we've seen patients that after, and I'm not talking about patients that they present with DSD, a disorder of sexual development. So this is a quite different thing. I'm talking about patients that the Otherwise, the hormonal status are, is normal and within the normal range. So uh, these patients uh, need to know that we need to establish the, at least the early stages of adolescence before we go ahead with, uh, it's advisable at least, before we go ahead with any treatment because we don't want to jeopardize bone density. We don't want to jeopardize the the, the reproductive function because these are the first age, uh, um, age, uh, years that the reproductive function starts to recruit the follicles or uh, uh, create the sperm. So if we stop this process at a very early stage, they might be primitive for good. So even if you stop the hormones later on, you might not be able to have an irreversible effect to your gonads, to say the least. So although they do use some blockers, uh, usually the majority of endocrinologists, they do ask patients to reach stage one or two of development before they initiate the treatment. And we know that after stage two, it's uh, we do we can preserve the, the sperm. Yes, we can preserve the sperm. We can have an echo lecture at the younger patient, but you need to be aware that, first of all, it is quite invasive. It requires counseling. And in order to be NHS, it's not, it's an expensive treatment that costs four to 5,000 pounds in order to go ahead with. And you need to be aware as well that if you want to be eligible in the future under NHS, by initiating the hormones, you just don't get this option, at least for now. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I think I've got all my questions answered. You answered a lot of them during the presentation. Um, has anybody else got any questions they want to ask? You can, you're welcome to speak, put your hand up, or if you want to just frantically type in the questions box. I mean, I think that was such a, an amazing overview of everything. You literally covered everything I could possibly think of. So I don't imagine that people have got very many questions. Um, what I'd really like to do, if it's okay with you, is get some of those links that you talked about that we can potentially share with this video so that people can yes. access that information if that's okay. So I'll put that up when we share the video on our website. Thank you. Um, but yeah, it looks like everybody's in a stunned silence. <laughs> so I, Guys, just I hope you enjoy it. Enough. I hope well, I didn't use a lot of medical words. That was uh, great. Nevertheless, I would like to thank uh, Fertility Network UK for this exceptional opportunity you have given me. And on behalf of all of the members of my team, uh, we're really looking forward to see you all in person. I hope that this will be done in the future in person. And um, uh, Claire, thank you so much for your help. Thank you very, very much. I can't thank you enough for doing this. It's so appreciated. Um, and we've had one comment saying um, you were brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Really engaging and eye-opening talk. Thank you both. We're getting some lovely comments coming in. Thank you so much for giving us your time. And as I say, this this recording will be put up on our, our YouTube channel and on our website. And we're hoping to have a page that is specifically dedicated for people and from the LGBTQ plus community. So there'll be as much information on there as we can possibly provide people that are on any sort of journey um, to parenthood in any way. So yeah, uh, thank you so much again. And we'll probably have you back another time if you'd be willing. <laughs> With great pleasure. Wonderful. Uh, good evening to everyone. Uh, Thank you, everybody. Contact me whenever you want to through LinkedIn. Have a great day. Bye bye. I appreciate it. Good night.